Father, we thank you. We acknowledge your greatness. We acknowledge your preeminence. We acknowledge your lordship. Precious King of glory, we submit under the government of your spirit. We come into alignment with the spirit that flow expressly from your presence. We align with the utterance of your spirit tonight. We come to the place of life that we may interact with life and light. We come to the place of power and authority that we may interact with the dimension of your power and of your authority. Precious Father, we yield our hearts to you tonight and we ask, O oh God, that your word permeate our heart. You speak with authority and power, bring light to our vessel, bring instruction to our soul, bring conviction to our hearts for the glory of your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Please, you may be seated gorgeously in God's presence. You might want to turn to your neighbor to the left and to the right and welcome them to church. Tell them how beautiful and handsome they are looking. Celebrate you in Jesus' name. You are the Lord Most high You are the Lord you are the Lord, most high, you are the Lord. You made your way in the sea, you are the Lord. You are the Lord, most high, you are the Lord. You are the Lord, most high, you are the Lord. You are the Lord, most high, you are the Lord. You made the way in the sea, you are the Lord. You are the Lord. Most high, you are the Lord. When the earth tell our name, when the high tell our name, when the high tell most silent, it all is good. When we need to hope, to hope, O mine talio saile moto wa E mine talio mo dio ko fele O mai tanio kaso saidi morano O mine taho saho wa hene O fialo saile mo de uwe O fe haile me Saile mo ga ho e o Ah Saile me lani tra ko fa do e le E se ben en ta bla rico bla ho sa o ne O fi di a lo ga bo di e o e O fi na hi te O fi na ko u bu la u le A saile mo ra ka bi no ka bi o to se Abelai tako praho sa umene Ofie kabuali 
Luke chapter 4. We read from verse 1. The book of Luke chapter 4. Meanwhile, I like you to know that the Lord is doing tremendous things here. Tremendous things. I don't know how the service team decided to take testimony today. Personally, I've received a lot of testimonies from our brethren here of what the Lord has done for them. Since the service team have gone ahead to demand for testimony. I think there's a sister, is she here? She's not here. She met me on Monday. She has been trusting the Lord for open doors to travel out for over three years now. And um, I think two Thursdays ago, during boiling point service like this, we were praying and we were decreeing that doors be open. According to her, strangely, she went for another try after the service and everything came out just like that. And by the end of this month, she's going to be leaving the country to another country. Can you celebrate Jesus? Probably she's busy sorting out her traveling stuff and she's not here. There's another sister. Where is Eva? Okay. She's on the camera. She's a worker now. So you are free to build her. The Lord has given her a job. There are plenty of them. See, this one is hiding her face. Faith is hiding her face. And um, one of our brother, he and his wife started worshiping with us of recent. And according to him, after one of the service, he applied for a job. I've forgotten. It's one of the federal parastatus. And miraculously, God gave him the job. And they've been telling me secretly, but I felt it's no season to celebrate. We should keep pressing. Amen. One of our sister brought her mother here. We prayed, went home, went to visit them, prayed again. Multiple problems, multiple problems. She couldn't stand, she couldn't walk, kidney problem, heart failure, all kinds of stuff. I prayed for her, blessed the oil as I was led by the Spirit and gave her. The daughter came here the other day to testify that they went for checkup and like almost, I think every week or every month they go for dialysis and since the prayer they've not gone. And when they went the last time, everything was normal. As touching the kidney. So we are trusting the Lord to perfect the other areas of our health. So God is doing amazing things here. I want you to come here in faith, come here believing. Though what we are most, much interested in now is capacity building. And by the time we are done with this phase of capacity building, we will begin to deploy the dividends of heaven. Praise God. But while we are building capacity, we will also be taking of that which is available and using it to better the lives of those who are in their need of them. 
in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. You are next in line for a testimony. If you believe that, you will shout a better amen. amen. Luke chapter 4 verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit. It's okay, maintain the former sound before it starts. And was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days, he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command the stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain, show him, show unto him all the kingdoms of the whole world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will. I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Numbers Chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch and on the east side towards the rising of the sun shall they of the standard of the camp of Judah pitch throughout their armies and nation the son of Abinadab shall be captain of the children of Judah and his host, and those that were numbered of them, were three score and fourteen thousand and six hundred. Praise the Lord. I'd like you to take number chapter two, verse one down. I want us to look at something briefly. You know, I was telling us last week about. contemplating on who God is. And we say that if you begin to contemplate on the personalities of God or the personality of God, you will wonder at many things. You will be marveled by many things. And you will come into and an understanding of who this personality is. God is a being, and as a being, is a being of laws and order. Praise God. The whole of his realm is structured upon rigid laws and order and it is established in uncompromised laws and order for instance 
What keeps the throne of God impregnable, undefiled, unpolluted is because it is hanging upon what? Righteousness and upon justice. So the moment iniquity finds its way into the throne of God, it's no longer fit to be called the throne of God because the standard upon which that throne is situated is upon what? Righteousness and upon justice. So this standard by God cannot be compromised by anything. It cannot be changed. So part of what makes him who he is is captured in his in inability to compromise his standard. One day I was praying and I was I was bitter. I was complaining rather than praying. And I was telling the Lord like, how long will I continue like this? When will you show up? Why? why? And the Lord spoke to me. He called me. He said, Victor, I do not bend to accommodate sons of men into my kingdom. Rather, sons of men are commanded to bend in order to be accommodated in my kingdom. In other words, the realm where God dwells is a realm that is structured. It's like it's cast already. It's fixed. There is nothing you can do, no prayer that you can pray that will alter the structure that has been established. In the book of, is it first or second Timothy now? The Bible says, nevertheless, the standard of the Lord standard short. The foundation of the Lord did what? Standard short. Everyone that named the name of the Lord shall what? Should depart from iniquity. That is a standard. That is a law. That is an order. If it is the name of the Lord that you want to call upon, the first thing you must set to within yourself in order for your voice to be recorded in this realm is that you will what? You will depart from iniquity. Are we together? If you are here, shout amen. So God is a God of order. And everything about God exists and is established on rigid laws, rigid protocols, rigid principles. If you read the book of Genesis chapter 2, for instance, you will see the, the story of the creation of man. And when God formed man of the dust of the field, of the ground, the Bible says he breathed into his nostril the bread of life and the man became a living soul. And that was not enough. The Lord also went ahead and created a garden. And when he was done creating this garden, planted all kinds of trees and fruit within this garden and took the man that he created, placed him in the garden and gave him a commandment. And told him of all the trees that is found within this garden. Freely you can eat of them. But of the tree that is found in the, in the midst of the garden. Thou shall not eat. You know at face value. You will think it's just an ordinary instruction. You will think it's just an ordinary commandment. But behind this commandment was the key that kept creation. The fabrics of creation together. Are you with me? Behind this, thou shall not eat. Was the key. This is why God it cannot be predicted. His ways can, no man can come to you and say, I know God. Such a person is lying. You only know a part that he allow you to know. But you cannot predict him. Because when he says stand, that word stand, is deeper than just the action of standing. It could interpret many things in his own realm. So the Lord said to the man, of all the trees that is in the garden, thou shall freely eat of them. But of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, thou shall not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest of it, thou shall what? Shall surely die. The man was thinking, well, I don't want to die, so I will not eat of it. But when the tempter came, he brought another perspective. 
that was not captured in the mind of the man that was giving the instruction. And the tempter told him, you will not surely die for God doth know. And the instruction he gave the wife was quite different. God, he said, God said we should not even touch this fruit. Are you with me? Follow me. I'm going somewhere. I want to show us about the order and the structure of God's operation. He said, God said, we should not eat of it, nor touch it. And the moment they touched it, first thing that happened was what? Nothing happened to them. When she touched it, she was expecting to fall down and die. And nothing happened to her. She now went further, eat of it. Hoping that she will fall down and die. Nothing happened to her. And then she gave it to her husband that was with her. And the man seeing that nothing happened to his wife when, he touched, when she touched the fruit. Nothing happened to, to her when she ate the fruit. He became confused of the instruction. Not knowing that that instruction that was given was what kept the fabrics of creation impregnable to the infiltration of alien spirit. And what he was about to do was to open a window that does not exist or that was locked away. And the moment he took of the fruit, the Bible said their eyes were open and they knew that they were what? That they were naked. So, an entire different creature emerged by just that simple act of disobedience. Whereas they were naked before now, it was never a question of shame. There was nothing wrong. They, they don't care. So there were the man that whose eyes was open was a different creature from the man that was under the government of God. So the moment he violated the instruction of God, he changed the creation that God created just because he violated the instruction of God. Are you with me? If you are here, you shout amen. Because God is mysterious. His ways are unpredictable. He carved principles, structures, laws, and orders that if carefully followed, we yield measure of result. God is mysterious. And because he's mysterious, you cannot stumble on him and say, oh, this is God. Because you will end up being deceived. If God is mysterious, he's unseen, then how do I apprehend him? That is why he created certain principles, certain laws, certain ordinances that if rigidly followed, will lead you to a dimension of him. And one of these laws, one of these order, or one of these provisions rather, is the principles of law and order. Because God is an ever-flowing reality, an inexhaustible force, an inexhaustible dynamics. You cannot wake up and say, oh, this is God. Because even the devil that felt he knew God, he knew a measure of God. When he saw God walking on the earth, he didn't know that killing him was going to, was ultimately going to free him. And the Bible said they regretted that assuming the God of this world knew, the princes of this world knew, they would not have what? crucify the Lord of glory. When they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him, the great one was there laughing at their foolishness because they never knew that ultimately that was his ultimate desire that they will what? They will unleash him. Whereas when he was on earth, he was localized. But if they unleash him and they lift him up, he say, I and I, if I be lifted up, I will what? I will draw all men so that act of crucifying him, 
that they never knew, they thought they were getting rid of him of the earth. They release him into you. They release him into you. They release him into you. They release him into me. They release him into thousands of people all over the world. So the princes of this world regretted that action because they never understood that God is a mystery. And because it's a mystery, you cannot, you cannot predict him. Even you as his child, you cannot predict God. But there are certain things that if you follow, it will yield you a measure of understanding of who God is. The first thing that I want us to look at is that in the law of order, following the order of God, it provokes divine immunity and ensures invincibility. When you identify the order of God and follow it strictly, the first thing it secure for you is divine immunity, divine invisibility. It ensures that you become invincible. In the book of Numbers chapter 2 that we read, the Bible says God spoke to Moses and to Aaron to structure the people of Israel according to a particular order. According to a particular structure. It said Judah should occupy the eastern gate. This person should occupy the, 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 the southern gate. This tribe should be situated at the southern gate, the western gate. That's why I say if you go home, read it. Now, Moses could have just argued because he doesn't know what God was trying to achieve. But when they were situated around the tabernacle like that, a time came in the same book of Numbers that they came to a territory of a king called Balak. And Balak feared the people greatly. That he went to invoke a man called Balaam. Are you with me? He traveled. He sent his servant to the prophet called Balaam. And if you read the book of Numbers carefully. You will see the credentials of Balaam. He said he is the man that sees with his eyes what? Open. He said Balaam is a man that if he curse you, you are cursed. If he bless you, you are blessed. Is a man that he fall into trance with his eyes open. Picture that a minute. I know many of you are falling into trance before. If you fall into trance, you will not be conscious of this realm. You, it's like you've drifted into momentary sleep. But this man, he has the capacity to be seeing the spirit realm and be conscious of the natural realm. That was the level of rank he has. And the Bible says, whosoever he calls, that person is cursed. Whosoever he blessed, that person is blessed. And Balaam sent for him that he will come and curse the people of Israel. At first he refused. They persuaded him the more with gold and silver and all of that. And suddenly he followed them. When he came, made requests of what it will take to secure is a very dangerous course that we end the people of Israel. It says seven bullocks. Seven what? Seven, seven. When that sacrifice was made, he lifted up his parable. And when he wanted to utter a course, the only thing that proceeded from him was what? Was blessings. The only thing that proceeded from his mouth was what? Was blessing. He was not, it's not, that was not what he wanted to do. Already his soul is gone. He wanted the gain of Balak. And he was ready to partner with Balak using his prophetic office. But something happened. A power stronger than him compelled his mouth to release blessings rather than cause. How did this happen? 
if you read the book of Numbers chapter 23, verse 23, it said there shall be no, there is no enchantment against Jacob. Neither is there divination against who? Against Israel. Why? Because he attempted, but the parable could not work. It was in, it was in, um, in Numbers 24, Number 24, that we saw why Balaam could not curse the people of Israel. He said, and Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel. He went not as at other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his face towards the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel abiding in his what? In his tents. According to their what? Their tribes. And the spirit of God came upon him. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, had said, and the man whose eyes are open has said, he had said, which heard the words of God, which saw the visions of the Almighty falling into trance, but having his eyes open. Verse 5. He said, How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel? So, from the spirit realm, when he saw the arrangement of the children of Israel, when he saw how they were arrayed round about the tabernacle, there was no breaking of rank. There was no disarray, nothing disarray. There was no one that was outside of the alignment. Everyone was gathered inside the circle. They were looking for loopholes that could bring an entrance of, a cha of an enchantment, of a cause, of of a negative world but when they saw their reality from the spirit there was no rancor among them and the bible said when he saw this the spirit of the lord descended on him when he saw israel abiding in his tent there was nothing wrong with the israelite because everyone was found within the perimeter of god's jurisdiction god spoke to moses and to aaron that they should arrange the tribe according to their standard let everyone bear the flag of their tribe so when he looked at judah judah was where he was supposed to be and the emblem of the tribe of judah was lifted high in their camp when they look at Issachar, they were all arrayed in one accord there was no disagreement among them why did i say it provoked divine divine what? Immunity. They were not aware of what was coming against them. Are you, are, are you with me? They were just doing their thing. Yet, the enemy have, inv have arisen against them. They were not praying and fasting. They were just dwelling in their tent according to the commandment of the Lord. Yet, when the enemy came in, looking for loophole in order to afflict them there was no entrance point because everywhere was what was sealed so wherever order is found the power of protection abounds if your life is patterned after the order of God there are prayers you will not pray. There are fastings you will not do. There are covenants you will not practice. Because you have decided to pattern your life after a certain kind of order. The enemy came against them in their innocence. Trying to victimize them. Trying to afflict them. But they despite all the, the the forces that were invoked against them. Do you know what it means to sacrifice seven rams? 
Balaam is not just an ordinary prophet. He's a prophet that understands priesthood. But with all his priesthood intelligence, all the knowledge he has acquired in the prophetic, he could not succeed because these men were abiding according to order. There was no one that felt he should be the leader among them. And the leader is not qualified to lead him. There was no grudges in their heart. When, you, when he saw their dwelling, their, their, their raiment in the spirit, everyone was in single file. Everyone was in alignment. And no matter the arrow that was shot against them, there was no room for entrance because everywhere was rigidly and solidly protected by the immunity that comes from God. So the strategy of immunity that God gave them was captured in that commandment found in the book of Numbers chapter 2 verse 2 that they should abide according to their standard. And when they obey, even when they were not aware of what was coming against them, the immunity of God protected them, kept them from harm, salvaged them from the permutations of evil and wicked men. If you pattern your life according to order, according to the divine order that have been prescribed in the scriptures, there are prayers you will not pray. There are battles you will not fight. There are forces that will never come near you. Because even though they come, there is no entrance point. There is no access road. Our lives are too porous. That is why they, 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 they throw the arrow of headache. You carry my grain for three years. Porous. Incubus will knock on your door and you will fall your catar. Because there is no what? No order. No principles that you are following. No commandment from Jehovah that you are ardently obeying. For you everything goes. But the way of the spiritual man is captured in his ability to secure the word from the Lord and pattern his life after this word, irrespective of whatever it is that is invoked. Hope you know we are in a generation called Gen Z. Am I correct? Gen Z is characterized with invoking anything invocable and calling it woke. So you can just decide, I don't feel like I'm a man. I'm a woman trapped in a male body. So I want to identify as who? As a woman. And every right that a woman has, I want it to be accredited to me. Gen Z. If you don't protect your life and you don't gather yourself to live according to divine order, the day you will wake up, you will discover that your wife no longer makes sense to you. You will discover that your children no longer make sense. You will feel, you will want to identify as transparent. Hope you know there is one called transparent now. I don't feel like I'm a parent. So I am transparent. Gen Z. But when those arrows are shot and they come near you, there's no entrance point because your life is gathered according to rigid laws and order. There are things you will never get yourself to do. There are words you can never say. There are videos you will never expose yourself to. There are sounds you will never expose yourself to. Because that is how spirits are trafficked. Spirit travel on the frequency of vibration. There are certain vibrations that you expose yourself to. That we invoke demons into your life. This is why they will tell you, don't listen to secular sound. Because you don't know the spirit that inspired that sound. Or oh, my generation will ask questions. What is wrong with listening to it? They are calling God name in it. Oh, 
Okay, my time. Oh. Number two, following divine orders and principles provoke God into action. They provoke God into action. We saw this in the book of 1 Kings chapter 18 from verse 30 to 39. We saw the battle between Elijah, the prophet, the Tishbite, and the prophet of Baal. When Elijah summoned a contest and challenged the prophet of Baal to a battle. Now let us, each one of us, call on the name of our God, the God that answers by fire. Let him be who? Let him be our be God. And they agreed. And all of them brought all the sacrifice as required. Slaughtered them and they began to call. The prophet of Baal went first. They started calling on Baal from morning to afternoon. And Baal seems to travel. Elijah started mocking them. They went ahead until they started cutting themselves. Theirselves rather. Blood started dripping. Crying to Baal to come. And Baal was on leave. And then it got to the turn of Elijah. But something amazed me in this story. Elijah was playing priesthood intelligence upon them. But they were never aware. They were calling on Baal from money. Calling. Calling. And Baal was not answering them. And Elijah never said, okay, no, you people have tried. Let me try my own. But he waited until a certain time. And the Bible said in verse 30. And Elijah said unto the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. So, the first thing you will do to provoke God's action in your life is to what? To repair damages. Damages. Hope you know the Bible says, Know you know that. Your body is the temple of the Lord and that the spirit of the Lord dwells in you. If the spirit of the Lord dwells in you, where is the altar? If you are the temple, where is the altar of God? It's your heart. So the heart becomes the altar. That becomes the dwelling place of God in the life of a man. But there are many people whose heart is dark, full of evil and wickedness. They will come to church and lift up holy heads, crying when worship is going on. But when they step out, they begin to backbite. They begin to devise mischief. They lie. They do all kinds of things. They envy. There is bitterness locked up within this heart. That kind of altar cannot produce any intervention from God. In the book of Psalm 24, the Bible says, Who is he that shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He said, He that is what? is of a pure heart and is of a clean hand who have not lifted up his soul to vanity nor sworn deceitfully he says such shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation so if you come before the Lord trusting him to intervene or to provoke a certain kind of intervention from him with a broken heart with a dark heart with a wicked heart. That God that you are seeking is not the Jehovah that dwells in the coast of fire, in the midst of the coast of fire. Probably you are seeking Shungo or something else. But if it is Jehovah El that you come seeking, the criteria is that you will repair the damage. You will punch your heart. The Bible says, and Elijah repair the altar. Okay. The altar has shifted from a location to your heart. That's where your altar is. So if your altar is in your heart, what kind of transaction goes on in your heart? The elders of Israel came to Ezekiel in the book of Ezekiel 14. And they came to inquire of the Lord. And when they appeared before the prophet, the spirit of the Lord came upon the prophet. And God whispered to him. He said, son of man, should I be inquired of by these people? Seeing that they have idols in their heart. 
In other words, they went religiously to seek the impute of God. However, they already know what they wanted. They already concluded on the outcome of what they want to see. So going to the prophet to seek the will of God was just for religious purposes. Just like many of you here. Many brothers are coming. You are rejecting. Many sisters are coming. You are rejecting. And the one your eye have catch is not even in your league. But you know, you believe that, oh, Jehovah has spoken. You will see people come, send me a message. Man of God, I want to know if this is my wife. I've known her for Oh God, if you like, pray from now until Jesus come. You will not hear because idol have entered your heart. But the problem there is that even if you hear or see anything, you will see according to the multitude of the idol that is in your heart. Because that was what God said there. He said, I will answer them according to the multitude of the idol that is in their heart. Somebody is going through training. You know you have a call. God have called you. You are aware. You are sure that he called you. He had an assignment for you. And you are going through a season of training and drilling and chiseling. Then you are applying for a job. Because you will say, Lord, let me work briefly. I'll work for two years, gather some money, then I'll resign and come. You will never resign. Once you enter, you have entered. They will trap you there. So, after you will start seeing the bonuses. If you work three years, you from 250,000, you can earn 500,000. See, ah, that's big money. Oh. Then as you enter that realm of 500,000, you begin to see other opportunity. If you become a manager, they will give you traveling allowances. What, two million? Your housing allowance will reach eight million. And you, ah, what am I seeking the Lord? That's how a glorious destiny, a glorious ministry will be buried in an office. Because the Lord will answer you according to the multitude of the idol that is in your heart. The Bible says Elijah repaired the altar. So to provoke God's intervention in your life, you must first of all learn to repair the altar. Is there malice in your heart? Let it go. Is there bitterness? Is there, is there envy? Do you feel more superior to others than you should? I'm alone. I know some people will not like me today. But it's fine. If I help you build alignment, my job is finished. Praise the Lord. And in verse 3, in verse 31, And Elijah took 12 stones according to the numbers of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench about the author as great as wood contain two measure of sea you can go home and read the scripture I'm going far when Elijah said to the issue of the author and satisfy other demand spiritual requirement when he lifted up his voice he didn't finish his statement before the fire descended. And the fire that came did not just consume the wood that was sacrificed. Did not just consume the wood. Did not just consume the stone. Even the water that was there in the trench was what? Was licked up. Because when he met the requirement of the Lord, when he satisfied the demand and follow divine order and principle. He provoked God into action. What is this divine order? He arranged the altar. He built the altar that was damaged. He gained alignment with prophetic signals because when he lifted up his voice, it was at the time of the evening oblation. The time that incense should go up. So the potter 
we were open unto him at that time. And when he lifted up his voice, there was no hindrance. If you can I tell you a secret? If you appear on the altar of prayer and you start praying, and after five minutes you are still struggling. Leave the prayer. Begin to tell the Lord, purge my heart. Purge my heart. As you are praying that prayer, names will be coming into your mind. Pictures. Actions you took that were wrong. They will be coming. Those are the purging fire of the spirit. Follow those things carefully. When you are done dealing with those things, you will burst into a new realm. Because all the debris and hindrances have been taken away. If you struggle, don't be say quick to say, oh, I'm tired. No. If you, if you are tired, it's because you are carrying heavy load, bitterness, unforgiveness, wickedness. It's, like, it's finding, it's trying to enter a place in your heart. But when the altar is built and you align with prophetic instructions, injunctions, as you lift up your voice, you will provoke God into action. If you are still with me, say amen. And number three, which is where I'm going. Divine order is the ultimate secret to God's power. You know, when we read the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1, I mean chapter 4, from verse 1 down, we saw the temptation of Jesus. And in verse 4, we saw a specific temptation. The Bible says, after the 40 days of fasting, Jesus was hungry. And when he was hungry, the enemy came to him, the tempter came. And he said, he made a statement. He said, if thou be the son of God, command this stone to be made bread. Jesus was trying to provoke, the devil rather, was trying to provoke Jesus to prove his identity. And if Jesus had obeyed and go ahead, it means he has left the spirit and started functioning in the flesh. Because part of the language of the flesh is that he provokes you to want to show yourself. He wants you to make yourself known. But if you read the book of Luke chapter 3, you will discover that, I think it's in verse 21 or verse 16, the Bible said when Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan, when he was coming out of the Jordan River, praying in tongues, the heavens were open and the spirit of the Lord came down in the likeness of a dove and descended upon him. And there was a voice that thundered from heaven that said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am what? Well, please. So it was a national announcement. This announcement was not, was not restricted to the, the hearing of those whose spiritual ears were open. As long as you are within that parameter, you will hear. Even the animals heard because the one that turned that is the creator of all things. Even if you were deaf and you were in that parameter, you will hear that the great one said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. How come? A few verses after, the devil came asking the same question. It means the devil heard when that utterance was made. But just like he came to Adam and Eve in the garden, he met him in the wilderness. He said, Ah, oh, I heard the statement, and I'm not sure. So you are the son of God. Okay. I'm not arguing. There's only way, one way you can prove this title of a son of God. Hey, now you are hungry. This no here commanded to be made bread. After all, you are the son of God. That is one way to prove to us that you are what? You are a son of God. And Jesus would have just said, okay, stone. Barra, barra, barra. Stone, be made bread. And bread will appear. Just like when God spoke to Moses, and say, speak to the rock and let it bring out water for you. 
Instead of speaking, Moses did what? Moses struck the rock. The result was evident. The water gushed out. But he failed the test of the mortars. So, if Jesus had spoken to the stone, bread would have still emerged. But he would have lost the battle to the enemy. So, when Jesus anticipated or saw the game the enemy was playing, he knew he was not supposed to take instruction from the devil. And he knew that he has nothing to prove to anybody. It's not him, it's not him that is supposed to validate himself as as a son of God. It is already a reality. If I meet you now, I say, Ago, are you truly the son of Ago? Do you have anything to prove to me? If I say your name is Monday, if your name is Monday, do, do, so, do, so. do you have to do anything to prove to me that your name is Monday? If your name is Monday, your name is Monday. But the enemy was trying to get the Lord to obey him. Just like he convinced Adam and Eve to obey him. And Jesus replied him. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. But the father liked to win battle. He's not just interested in winning battle. He's interested in winning battle in a particular way. Jesus was going to be declared again the son of God but not be on the request of Satan. Not at the demand or at the command of Satan. So if you travel to the book of Romans chapter 1 from verse 1 to 4 we saw how Jesus was declared the son of God. The Bible said that when the devil came to Jesus in the wilderness the father was seated on his throne and he was watching and the father was more than willing to showcase to the whole world and even to the rest of the Hades of Hades that this personality is my begotten son in whom I am well pleased. The greatest display of the power of God was not captured in creation. The greatest display of the power of Jehovah was not when was not displayed in Egypt. The greatest display of the power of God as captured in scripture was on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. In the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 4, the Bible says he was declared to be the son of God by the spirit of what? Of holiness. By the resurrection from the dead. So, Satan was trying to fast forward what will happen in the future. So he came to him in Luke chapter 4. Command the stone to be made bread. If thou be the son of God. You don't have to fast forward the battle. I will be declared. You don't have to come to me. I will come to you. And there you will know that I am the son of God. So when they crucified him and he was buried. The Bible said he went to Hades. Have you read the scripture that say, having spoiled principalities and powers? Those are not words, so. those are personalities. Principalities and powers. If you read your Bible, you will hear names like Abaddon. You will hear names like Beelzebub. You will hear names like Belia. You will hear names like Apollyon. You will hear names like which one? Leviathan. All of these are personalities that are that probably have the ranking of Lucifer or Satan the devil. The Bible said that we all gathered principalities and powers. There was Dagon there. There was Asteroid there. All of them were gathered at that grave.
to ensure that they join their forces together to keep the body down. But when that morning came, there was something called the spirit of holiness. With the powers that were present and the forces of hell that were gathered to keep him trapped. Jehovah sent the spirit of holiness. In the history of mankind, nobody has said I will die and after three days I will come up. If you want me to prove to you that I'm the son of God, I'm going to die, destroy this temple. And after three days, I will raise it up. After three days. And they knew what he was saying. No man talked like that except you be God. <laughs> and when it was the third day, I could see all the forces migrating from different regions to assemble at that site. But the spirit of holiness came. <laughs> and when he landed, he landed with so much power that Satan couldn't stand. Apollyon couldn't stand. Belzebub couldn't stand. Uh, Belia couldn't stand. And when the spirit of holiness appeared, all of them gave way. And the Son of God stood up. The Bible said, and he was declared to be the Son of God by the spirit of holiness. What the devil wanted him to do ahead of time by performing miracles, Jehovah himself did it by demonstrating a dimension of his power never seen before. There's somebody under the sound of my voice. You are coming under pressure daily to prove to yourself that, to prove to somebody that you are serving Jesus. No, you have nothing to prove. Let your life do the proving. Let the fruit of the spirit be the proof. Let, let, let you know Messiah. They come to you, they say, why are you always going to church? Don't answer them. Let your fruit answer them. Let the things you achieve for God and the fruit you bear for God be the response. You are all emotion. They will come to you and say, you always pray. My mama disturbing everybody. What are you, where is the result of the prayer? You have nothing to what? My answer is, I have nothing to tell you. Let my life be the testimony. Let my life be the proof. Come and check me. If you catch me living in sin, if you catch me hiding, if you catch me battling with anything, then you can. But as long as I am standing before Jehovah blameless, it is more than enough. The Bible says he was declared to be the son of God by the spirit of what? Of holiness. The devil come many times trying to make you move in the flesh so that you can prove to him that you are somebody. No, it's not until I handle the microphone before I know that I am anointed. No, it's not until we give you the mic to sing before you know that you are anointed. It's not until you handle the microphone before you speak in capital letter tongues. If you appear before the presence of your father, it is a good place to cry out to him. We don't do things to prove a point to anybody. When we do things, we do because we are in a covenant relationship with a date, with a spirit. I have nothing to prove to anybody. If it's two people that gather here, it doesn't mean I am failing. It is because that is the realm the Lord has desired that I walk for now. Listen. Let me show you something before we pray. Ah, oh, 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 oh,
Don't allow anybody to put you under pressure. Don't allow systems to put you under pressure. Don't allow family to put you under pressure. See what the Bible says in the book of 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12. The Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. He said, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. He said, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the spirit of what? The spirit of what? For the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you and their part is evil spoken of but on your part he be glorified are you going through trials and you look as if God has forgotten you Peter is admonishing you don't think the suffering you are going through is a sign that God has forgotten you. Rather, there is a weight that is upon you. The reason why you can go through that thing is because of the weight. The spirit of glory rests upon you. The spirit of glory. It might not look glorious yet, but how be it if you see it from another vista, from the angle of the spirit, you will discover that you are a glorious personality in the spirit realm. How can the voice of somebody set you bring discouragement to your heart and you begin to contemplate by slide and you begin to doubt the faithfulness of God? The devil wanted Jesus to prove that he was somebody. But the way Jesus won was by responding that he's a nobody. You don't know what is working inside of you. You don't know what is being worked inside of you. You don't know the architectural masterpiece that is being built inside of you. There is a glory that has been apportioned to you. There is a spirit that you are about to carry. No many days from now, the work of the spirit that is going on on your inside shall be revealed. And the Bible says, when Christ shall be revealed, you will be glad because you will be you will be glad with exceeding joy. We do not give up as though we have believed cunningly divine purpose. We are the generation that will bring our master to the nations. We will serve our generation the undiluted dimension of the spirit of Christ. Go ahead and pray in the spirit. I cannot do anything. I have nothing to prove. I am the servant of Jesus. It's enough. If you doubt my calling, go and ask Jesus. In Jesus' 
much less near we pray. 